Please welcome to the stage journalist, television presenter, and author Lisa Ling. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. How are y'all feeling? Come on, you can do better than that. How are you feeling? Fantastic. I am so thrilled to be with you today. Uh, as that voice of God just said, I am a journalist and an author, but one thing I cannot say I am uh, until recently is a business owner. <laughs> uh, because my sister and I have just started a new business, and uh, we can't really talk about it yet, but we are both so excited, but yet terrified at the same time. And so we're really looking forward to um, hearing all the wisdom that is going to come off of this stage just like you are. So uh, we are very, very excited. There's so much to learn. We, we have probative questions like how to find an accountant. Anyone know one that you can recommend? Okay, tweet me, okay, at Lisa Ling, because even though I'm Asian, I'm terrible with numbers. So <laughs> uh, that's going to be very, very important for me. So uh, let's get this quick book show started, shall we? I have a question for you. How many of you all have heard of Soul Cycle? <laughs> Hands in the air. Okay, if you haven't, you need to get out from under the rock you've been hiding under because Soul Cycle is the biggest phenomenon in fitness, but it's more than that. It really is a movement. Check out this video. take a risk and to jump in those rooms where telling people to follow your dreams, try something new and, and go where your heart is because we certainly did that. SoulCycle is an extraordinary place. It's an exercise community. It's social and it's joyful and you feel like a rock star. It's therapy, it's escape, it's, it's fun. People come to us for the workout, but they stay for the breakthroughs they have on the bike. People get to change their lives, their bodies, their attitude. You lose yourself in the rhythm and you lose yourself in the pack and you work way harder than you ever would on your own. I love what I do because I get to be the best part of people's day. for me to really describe it. It is joy, it is love, it is community. You can have soulful moments, you can cry, you can laugh. It makes you feel better about yourself, it makes you feel better about your day, and it, it just works. You know, when I think about Soul Cycle, what I find on the bike, for me, it's love. Yes! Even though I'm regretting the uh, pastries I ate this morning, uh, please welcome to the stage one of the co-founders of SoulCycle, Julie Rice.
Welcome, Julie. Before we start, I just have to read a couple of the accolades that have been uh, directed toward you. Rice has been honored as one of Goldman Sachs' 100 Builders and Innovators in 2013 and 14, and SoulCycle was voted one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies of fitness by Fast Company. SoulCycle was also rated the sixth most influential brand on Twitter at CES in January of 2015. And uh, Julie and her co-founder, Elizabeth Cutler, were voted one of Fast Company's most creative, I guess two of Fast Company's most creative people in business, and honored as two of Adweek's brand geniuses. Can we give it up for this extraordinary woman? <laughs> Julie, when you hear those accolades, Thinking back to when you first started SoulCycle in, uh, in a studio that you found on Craigslist on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, what do you think? You know, I think the interesting thing about being an entrepreneur is that you're sort of always in it. It's very hard to step outside of it and, and think about accolades or what's going on. I think as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about what's next, right? You're always moving the goalposts. And I, I can think about certain times where it was our first full class and we thought, wow, we've really made it. We have 35 people in the room. Or, you know, the business turned profitable and we started to cash flow. And that was a really significant moment where you think, okay, we're going to be okay. We can, we can pay the people that are working here. Or when we, when we started to scale and we opened across the country in California and I went to see the studio and I thought, this translates. People are going to understand this everywhere. They're not just going to understand it where I am standing in the lobby and actually delivering them their shoes and water. And I think there are moments as an entrepreneur that really feel like achievements and crystallize your success. I don't know that those are external accolades because I think you're really always so internally focused on where you are that those actually feel like the milestones and the moments. And when you say that, that you came to the realization this translates, what do you mean by that? I mean, what was your objective when you first set out to, to create SoulCycle? So it's interesting, you know, for Elizabeth and I, we were two women who were really looking for something that was actually more than exercise. We were looking for an experience where we could make friends, where we could relieve stress, where we could take an hour for ourselves and really feel like it was empowering us in a different way than just burning calories or checking it off the list. And I think that um, that's what we really strove to you know, when we set out to create this business, what we really wanted to do was create connection, create a human experience. It's easy to put people on a bike and play music in the background and think, okay, people are going to burn between 500 and 800 calories and they're going to look better. That's a no-brainer. You could do that a lot of different ways. We could all just walk around in a circle for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. But that being said, we really saw that this could be used as an opportunity for people to belong to something, to feel empowered and connected to themselves and other people. And that is something that we didn't know if we would be able to translate. And, and it, it is, you know, people are really looking for human connection. It, it's so true, this idea of wanting to be part of something seems so pervasive right now, especially because we are all kind of addicted to our yes. gadgets and so kind of immersed in our own worlds on social media, right? And so you really did create that, that kind of movement. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to feel connection to other human beings. That is just a basic human need. And when people ask about building the brand or can you believe you did it or how big it is and, you know, dollars and cents, I really think it's just that simple. I remember when it was just me working behind the front desk. It was in our first studio, which was in the rear lobby of a building on West 72nd Street. Uh, we had actually built the studio with very little money. We had no investors. We built the front desk from Ikea. We made six or seven trips in my business partner's station wagon to fit in all the kitchen cabinetry that would ultimately build our front desk. <laughs> And we set up shop in the back of this lobby and we had signed a lease where unfortunately we didn't realize that we were not going to be able to have a sign outside when passer buyers came by. So now we have a business in the density of New York City where we are unable to put a sign on the street. And so we had a business model that nobody had heard about. We had no sign on the street and pretty much we were the only people that worked there. So by the time people found us in the back of this building, you know, we had to make sure that they were coming back because taking a chance of finding somebody new was just too risky. And I only had a couple of customers, maybe 20 at the time in a day. And I remember 
thinking to myself, today I'm going to learn everybody's name and I'm going to remember something small. Do they like their water warm or do they like it cold from the refrigerator? And people would walk in and I would use their name when they would come back for the second time and I would hand them a bottle of warm water or a bottle of cold water, depending on their preference. And you could see people's faces drop, that another human being in a big, busy city would take time to not only remember their name but remember something small about them. And that really was the entire crux of SoulCycle. It was really about building a customer service experience that mattered in people's lives. And once you actually meant something to people, we realized that it, it, it almost didn't matter what you were selling, right? Because that connection to your customer, actually making them feel as if it was their place, it was their tribe, that's where they went to belong to something bigger than themselves, that, that's actually what was SoulCycle. I love that. Uh, at a certain point, uh, you and your partner hired a business coach yes. to help you with some of the, the communications issues that you were having. Why did you do that, and would you recommend that to people? Oh, I would recommend it to people who have a partner or just have themselves. <laughs> Equally necessary. Uh, Elizabeth and I, uh, we were two strangers. We met over lunch. We were both exercising at different fitness clubs in the city. And one teacher, uh, I had said to this teacher, I have a really different idea. I think fitness could be more than a workout. It could be an experience. She said to me, you know, there's a woman that's working out with me in another gym. You two should meet. She wants to invest in something. And so we met and we were you know, strangers, and five months later, we opened this business together, and all of a sudden, you know, we shared money, we filed taxes together, uh, we saw each other more than our husbands and our children at the time. And to assume that we were going to agree on everything or that we were going to know how to communicate in a relationship is actually a crazy <laughs> assumption. You know, I think that we all assume that we are just born with communication skills, and I find that's actually not the case. It's really interesting that, you know, we don't teach our children how to communicate with each other in school. And so we decided early on, we had a policy where we said, you know, no lumpy carpets. We were going to make sure that we always talked through things and figured out a way that we could be on the same page, even if we agreed to disagree, which often we did. But we worked with a coach, and interestingly enough, she would teach us skills. She would help us find common ground. We didn't always agree, but at least we could put each ourselves in the other person's shoes. And what we learned working with our coach we took and we would feed down to the rest of the organization. So if we learned how to communicate through having a difficult conversation, we would kind of package that and we would create a module out of it and we would teach it to the rest of our organization so that they could communicate with each other the same way that we were communicating with each other. And slowly but surely, those were actually real building blocks of our culture. Which raises a really important question for me is, because you have said that finding the right partner is, is really essential and can, can help your business uh, you know, soar, right? So how did you actually know, or when did you know, that you had found the right partner? It's funny, uh, Elizabeth, uh, SoulCycle is a real love child of Elizabeth and I. I, I think that it's sometimes these things are actually just bigger than you. I think there's a real gut instinct, though. We always say, you know, if we had met at college, we probably wouldn't have been roommates or best friends. We are just about as different as two people can get. But we met at this lunch, and it was a conversation that sort of never ended, and 12 years later, it's still going on. We, we see things, we have a really common vision about what we'd like to deliver to the world, and yet we have really opposite skill sets. And so I'm sure that every entrepreneur in the audience can relate to there comes a moment where you just are sort of paralyzed. You get to a place where, whether it's fundraising, whether it's, you know, HR issues, you know, marketing, where you yourself think, I just don't know the answer to this. And I will say for the two of us, there was such a momentum because when she didn't know the answer, I did. And when I didn't know the answer, she did. And we were really able to sort of keep each other going. And again, I just think it was sort of a, it was a gut thing, but it's definitely something that has developed into a, a real shorthand and an incredible working relationship over time. Well, and, and last year, you and this woman that you met in the coffee shop one day years ago started a new venture called Life Shop. Tell us about it. So we are now, um, we're working on some new concepts of our own, and we are also consulting and advising and using some of the skill sets that we learned uh, at SoulCycle to help entrepreneurs and businesses at scale to really figure out who they want to be in the world and to grow. 
Are you, are you incorporating this whole tribe thing into these new businesses? I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> look, you know, I, I think you know, from, from, the, from the opening remarks in this conference to what we, the way we all, we all want to live in the world, I think that you know, finding core values and figuring out how to express them to the world and how to create these connections with people is so primary. And uh, that's definitely something that we're focusing on. You said when we first sat down that as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking of the next thing. Is that something that, that you have always just done? And why is it important to do that? Well, I, I, think, I think innovation is, is incredibly important as an entrepreneur. And so just when your customer is happy, you sort of need to think, what is the next thing that they are going to want from me? But I think I think thinking ahead really keeps you in check. It keeps you very aware and it actually keeps you present. If you're always thinking sort of, how can I surprise and delight my consumer? Or how, can I, how can I sort of over serve them? You know, which is what ultimately happens when you continue to think about it. I can honestly say there was never a point in, at SoulCycle where we thought, mm, this is perfect. I can, I can rest now. It's always about what, thinking forward, thinking what's happening, how is the world moving, continuing to learn. And I think if you, if you continue to sort of be a student of the world and your own business, that's a real recipe for success. You sold SoulCycle. We did. Uh, in 2016? Correct. 2016. Do you have any regrets? And when did you know it was the right time? Well, you know, I, it's, it's sort of like sending a child off to college, right? It's, it's, it's never really the right time. You'd like them to live with you forever if you could. But it, uh, it had gotten to a, a point where we, we knew the business was mature. We had definitely uh, grown it to a place that we were thrilled with. We were really ready to think about what was next. Uh, there's so many interesting things going on in the world, and it really felt like, you know, we felt it was in good hands and it was time to move on. And do you have any regrets? Of course. You know, your businesses are a part of you. Uh, you know, SoulCycle is, you know, a, a combination of the DNA of Elizabeth and I. But uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to scale a business and feel like the legacy and the product can continue to grow and change and be wonderful in the world. And as an entrepreneur, it also gives you freedom to create again, which is thrilling and terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm wondering now that you have started this new venture and have other things that you're thinking about, how long do you stick with an idea before you say, okay, it's time to move on to the next? I, I think probably everybody in this room can, can attest to the fact that when you are an entrepreneur that has an, that has an idea that you are passionate about, that idea usually won't go away. That's how you actually know. We always say there was no way that SoulCycle wasn't going to be born. You know, it woke me up in the middle of the night. It was speaking to me. It had its own voice. It told me how to write it. It told me how to brand it. It told me how to live it. It told me how to teach it. And there was nothing we could actually do to put that away. And I, I think that entrepreneurship is so uh, trying and it's so much work and starting a business is is really about, you're, you're really dedicating your life to it. and. I think unless the idea won't go away, you actually know. So to me, the idea either comes to you and it won't go away and you just stick with it until you're, you can give birth to it in some way, or if it's just sort of there, I think you can kind of also know that sort of being passionate about something is probably not going to get you to the finish line. You just, you just said that you, uh, you feel both excited and terrified. Do you think that you feel more terrified because you sold a, a, a colossally successful business or less? I think, for me anyway, I think the second time has, has felt scarier than the first time. It's, it's, it's like be careful of, of you know, you, what you don't know is, is sort of ignorance is bliss. We made so many mistakes in the beginning, mistake after mistake, but we just kept going. We would figure out how to recover from it. Uh, Elizabeth would always say, it's okay, neither of us had an MBA. This is just our tuition. You know, <laughs> as, 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 you know as, we, as we were spending the last $50,000 that was in our bank account and I was in a corner crying because I didn't know how we would pay rent the next day. But it kind of is tuition the first time. 
there's really no mistakes that you cannot recover from if you can just pull yourself together and keep going. And that kind of was the lesson for us. We did everything from incorrectly soundproof studios, so we had you know police showing up every day to tell us we had to shut down our business. We finally had a little bit of extra money and we were ready to build our first proper website and we completely blew up all of our technology and had to basically create call centers to manually service all the reservations that our computer system no longer took. But each time we did something that was a giant mistake, we would just keep going. We just would, would pick ourselves up and just gut it out. And I think the second time around, you know, you, you understand scale, you understand P&L, you understand marketing, you understand the mindset of a consumer. None of these things we understood in the beginning. It was all really just instinct. And I think that's something that's really interesting. I think trusting your gut the first time is really hard. And in some ways, trusting your gut a second time is even harder because you actually know the right questions to ask your gut this time around. <laughs> oh, you were, you were depleting your own savings. Did you have a good accountant? Because I know some. <laughs> right. Um, we, we, we had a good accountant. We continue to have a great accountant, which I personally am extremely thankful for. Um, my love is brand and people, and I'm not especially good at numbers. And our amazing accountants actually helped us to become profitable while we were actually just creating a labor of love. So um, that was, that's, that's really great. Could, if you could leave uh, some words of wisdom to this audience uh, about how to sustain a successful business, what would they be? You know, I, th I think to sustain a, a successful business, you have to continue to fuel your own passion. You have to actually be a user of your own product. You have to stay close to your customer. I, I can't tell you, I would say to the hundreds of corporate employees that we had sitting behind desks, everybody go out this morning, get into a studio, ride a bike, and stand behind the counter and talk to our customers for an hour. You will learn more doing that than you will at your desk in two months. And I think when you are really the user of your product and you stay close to it, you can continue to innovate in a way that's authentic. You can continue to listen to what people want because when you start to sit at a desk, you are no longer the customer and you don't really understand what people want. So I think continuing to be in it and be close to it is something that is never unimportant. And, and then I think as an entrepreneur, I just think we all have these huge ideas and we, we put our dreams out into the world and our dreams sort of seem this big. But if you can take your dreams and break them down into little bite sizes, I used to make myself a list of three things I needed to do in a day. It could have been figure out how to order towels or how to you know, change a pedal on a bicycle, or it could have been, how can I get the front page cover of the New York Times? But whatever those tasks were, they were always just little footsteps toward my bigger dream. And when you break it down like that, I think it really is a way to, to take small steps and make your big dream happen. And Julie, what do you wish you knew before you started your business? Hmm. Accounting. <laughs> Someone okay. yelled accounting. Accounting would have been great. <laughs> you know, That's what you're for. <laughs> you know, I'm happy for all the lessons that I learned on the job. There's nothing I really would have looked backward and done different. Everything that was a mistake turned out to be so valuable. And I think there is, is nothing like just finding your way through something and coming up with the organic solutions that you're, you're, you really feel are true to yourself. And... and what is the best way that you have found to handle criticism? Somebody, uh, I remember uh, when competitors started to come into our space and you know, press started to write articles about how it was so pricey and so exclusive and the truth was what we really were setting out to create was an experience that was inclusive, that made everybody feel better about themselves, that created communities of people. And once we achieved a little bit of success, we started to you know, get all the naysayers commenting. And somebody said something very interesting to me today. I actually have a post of it, of it on my computer and I keep it there. And they just said, high road, long view. You know, you always concentrate on what you're doing, what you want to put out into the world, what you are focused on. You don't listen to the noise. You don't worry about the competition. And if you, if you stay in your lane and figure out who you want to be in the world, then the rest of it really doesn't matter. Julie Rice, thank you so much thank for being for with having. us and, and continuing to encourage us. Thank you for having me. Julie Rice, everyone.